It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, session on uh, the role of arts, humanities, and social sciences in providing uh, knowledge and advice for the uh, SDGs. Uh, we were just talking about it, getting into the room that uh, occasionally social sciences and humanities are sort of on the outer limit at the outer border of the science advice discussion. It's certainly so looking uh, upon appointed science advisors worldwide and also looking upon the literature. But today we have to be in the big auditorium and I guess that uh, slowly the humanities and, and social sciences are moving into the center stage of uh, providing advice and taking on leadership in this domain as well as in others. What we will do today is uh, we will, uh, I will give you like a four or five minute introduction, just set the scene. Uh, and then we have uh, four distinguished speakers. We had a fifth speaker uh, dropping out uh, of the program a couple of weeks back. So I asked our colleague David Mayer from the European Commission to be a discussant today and come up with a couple of responses uh, after the talks. And given the fact that we're not too many people, I think we can try to stimulate quite lively open debate rather than uh, formal presentations. But let me just give you like two words of introduction to this idea about the humanities and social sciences moving into the science advice conversation. I even go so far here to talk about a new synthesis. And I think we do have uh, seen in the last 18, 24 months kind of some new geopolitical um, challenges emerging that really calls for social science and humanities expertise. Uh, look at discussions, for example, at the World Economic Forum this year in which um, top government and uh, corporate leaders uh, announces that questions around information and misinformation today are at the center stage of geopolitical policy making. Uh, you can't really find a newspaper, open a book, or go into a bookstore anywhere in the world without being confronted with this massive diagnosis that something is going wrong, that we are not really enjoying the right level of trust. We also heard it from Sir Peter this morning that our institutions are experiencing a crisis, that there might even be a crisis of citizenship going on these days, which we are also able to map, especially on the social media data. Uh, all that goes back to issues that we have been researching on for many years, not, if not decades, if not centuries, within the humanities and social sciences. So even though all this data is new, and even though polarization and distrust in our institutions uh, are emerging as a phenomenon right now, we do have tools in order to understand that and cultivate change. Um, so probably moving into the SDG discussion, technology alone is not gonna make the trick. And this is not again to polarize and talk about C.P. Snow's old idea about two cultures. I think we should have a synthesis, like the unity of science as we have also been speaking about this morning. But I don't think that technology in and of itself without human agency and without transdisciplinary collaboration will make the trick. So that's where we are today. Looking deeply into the SDGs, one will actually find quite a lot of open research questions for the humanities and social sciences. Look at something like building institutions, promoting justice and peace, uh, stimulating more gender equality, better education. These are all, as it were, topics for the social sciences and humanities to contribute with. And we have seen numerous initiatives just over the last years that are stimulating the same type of policy change, trying to include social sciences uh, at the global level. So we are witnessing what uh, Sir Peter and uh, James Wilson is naming a paradox of science advice. On the one hand, there seems to be a crisis taking place in society, uh, the communal belief structure, the narratives that were used to build our civilizations are no longer taken for granted at the same level as they used to, but at the other hand, we have an abundance of possibilities and also an abundance of uh, advice. So that's what we're here to discuss today. The transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary agenda is very much kicking off also with the merger uh, of ICSU and uh, ISSS. So that's uh, my introductory remark. Uh, my own starting point is to have kind of a bigger picture on sustainability and design thinking. When we take the long-term perspective, we will see how human sense-making is a key driver also for innovation and solving some of these key matters. So that's it uh, for me. Uh, I will then pass on uh, the word to uh, Professor Shujatya Raman, uh, which is a director of research at CPAS at the Australian National University. 
And for a longer biography, please uh, refer to the program. Welcome. So while my um, slides come up, um, let me just take this opportunity uh, to thank the organizers for this uh, invitation to speak. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I uh, have spent a couple of days um, in uh, Japan at other events uh, already. So last week in uh, uh, Osaka, the Center for uh, Co-Design, which has been doing some very interesting things in the, in the social science humanity space. Uh, and then yesterday at the Science Diplomacy uh, event uh, organized by the Australian National uh, University in um, uh, also the University of Tokyo. Okay, so we were um, asked uh, to be quite provocative uh, in this panel um, and sort of not follow the conventional uh, idea of you know presenting lots of material. Uh, so I'm going to try and my best uh, to set up a few um, observations for uh, discussion. So first off, I was really pleased, as, as David said as well, uh, the role of social sciences and humanities is increasingly acknowledged in these kinds of spaces. Uh, we heard uh, the need for uh, social sciences uh, explicitly uh, acknowledged and recognized this morning already uh, at the conference. Um, but I want to argue that maybe the basis for this recognition of the social sciences and humanities uh, is a bit misleading. So I want to say, that social sciences, humanities, SSH, if you want to use acronyms, is not really uh, just about people. Uh, and uh, on my slides, I think I, I've deliberately tried not to include a single picture of a human being, uh, uh, mainly um, to kind of resist uh, the uh, tendency in a lot of transdisciplinary uh, collaborations to say, here you've got the physical and natural sciences, and they look at the, the, you know, the real world, the physical, um, biophysical world. And here you've got uh, the social sciences, and they look simply uh, at people, at behavior. Uh, and my remarks are kind of predicated on the assumption that this kind of distinction is deeply problematic. Um, so it's not to say that people aren't important. Uh, so I think we'd all agree that uh, the social sciences and humanities are to a large part driven by the sense that people do matter. Uh, so in some ways you could say, uh, you know, this is at the heart of the kind of human-centric nature uh, of our disciplines. Uh, but the point is that people are fundamentally wrapped up in systems, in infrastructures, very often uh, not of their own choosing. So when we talk about things like behavior, when we use terms like behavior, attitudes, uh, and so forth, we really need to be mindful uh, of the wider context uh, in which uh, the, the kind of entanglement um, of people in, 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 the, in a wider context uh, and think about the importance of this for science advice. Okay, so just to then position my work uh, in my remarks uh, in relation to the context that I come from. Uh, so as David said, um, I am currently at the Australian National University. Uh, I joined uh, the Center for Public Awareness of Science in um, July of this year, uh, but the bulk of my academic uh, career has been uh, in the UK. Uh, so in the UK, I was involved in um, a, a very large uh, research program funded by uh, the Levy Hume Trust, a trust uh, called Making Science Public. Um, and uh, uh, I've been involved in setting up uh, an institute uh, called the Institute for uh, Science and Society, which this year reached uh, its 20th anniversary. Uh, so the bulk of my work has taken place in this context. Um, I've also spent time at the uh, university um, in uh, the United States, Arizona State University, which informed a lot of my uh, thinking about where we can uh, move forward in terms of building on our insights from social sciences and develop ways, if you like, to intervene, uh, develop ways to engage in policy spaces uh, such as this one today, uh, that we are in uh, today. Uh, so I want to acknowledge uh, uh, people at uh, Arizona State as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to briefly mention uh, a project uh, that uh, I was involved in, which was fun funded by the uh, ESRC Nexus Network, which uh, James Wilston uh, was the uh, director of. Uh, and this was interesting in the sense that, on the one hand, it was about energy, it was about uh, biomass energy, it was 
uh, directed very um, clearly to the SDGs, the SDG 7 in particular, uh, and it focused on uh, what we can learn from kind of bottom-up perspectives in Ghana. Uh, and this work would not have been possible uh, without a number of fantastic collaborations, uh, people in engineering, uh, but also Temilade, uh, Dr. T uh, Temilade Shesan, whose um, picture has already come up uh, as one of the INGSA um, research associates um, whose work was funded very recently and who you're going to hear from um, later in the, in the conference. Okay, so I just want to use um, one example from energy to uh, illustrate what, I'm, uh, what I want to summarize here. So these are kind of bold claims that I want to make and partly it's to kind of stimulate discussion. So if you think about the question, what knowledge do the social sciences and humanities offer on the SDGs? I want to say that actually there are the tools here which have not always been fully developed, extracted out uh, from the vast domain of, the, of knowledge that the social sciences have uh, produced. But the, actually there are the tools here for uh, coming up with a better, a truer, um, more comprehensive understanding of the real world, if you like. So we, uh, in, in the social sciences, I think we should um, s sort of not... Um, uh, kind of say that, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's work that we can leave to the physical sciences, uh, biophysical sciences, without at least some input uh, from the social, uh, social sciences uh, to thinking about, uh, you know, the nature of the, the conditions that we find ourselves in. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that uh, when we talk about the real world, it's social and it's material. Uh, so this is a very kind of uh, emerging theme, if you like, in the social sciences, highlighting the socio-materiality of what we're talking about. Uh, and so this distinction between social factors and physical or technical factors when it comes to science advice is just a convention. Um, and uh, and uh, so I would argue that uh, given the complexity of the SDGs, which has already been highlighted this morning, we do need uh, to pay attention to uh, ways of engaging uh, between these divisions. Uh, and just the one example that I'm going to give you uh, revolves around uh, SDG 7, um, which is, as you can see, about ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, right? So on the left-hand side uh, of, this, uh, sli of this slide, I want to draw attention to one of the common ways in which SDGs are conceptualized, or in, in this particular case, the energy SDG. Um, which is about um, trying to move away from the reliance in large parts of the world, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of uh, South Asia, uh, on uh, tr so-called traditional biomass. So even the term that is used there is about tradition. And we need to come out of the reliance on traditional biomass and move into kind of more modern, uh, modernized sources of um, generating energy for uh, basic uh, human needs. Um, a lot of this is predicated on the fact that um, when we talk about traditional biomass, we are talking about wood fuel that uh, uh, very often women, uh, girls are involved in uh, collecting. There's a lot of drudgery involved in doing this kind of work. And so for good reason, you can, you can imagine it, the aspiration to come up with um, alternative uh, ways of um, providing for fuel. Um, the work that we did in our ESRC Nexus project in Ghana um, suggests that there's a bit more complexity that we uh, probably need to be mindful of. So if you look at one of the uh, biomass uh, fuel sources, uh, charcoal that is very widely used in urban um, uh, environments in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but, but particularly also in Ghana, which is where uh, we, we uh, did our work, um, it's important to recognize that it's not going to be that easy or maybe even desirable to move the populations away uh, from the reliance on, on this fuel. So even where there is more modern fuel, like uh, liquid uh, LPG, for example, that's available, um, you find uh, even higher income uh, families uh, rely both on charcoal uh, as well as the modern fuels. And one of the reasons for that is there are a number of traditional foods that taste better uh, when uh, uh, cooked uh, with, with charcoal. Um, our work in collaboration with uh, partners um, in, um, in Ghana also highlighted that there's a very thriving value chain around uh, the production, the distribution, 
uh, access uh, to charcoal uh, in, in, uh, in Ghana uh, that we shouldn't uh, forget about. There's a lot of, uh, we, we can draw attention to a lot of um, kind of flexibility and nimbleness, uh, innovation um, very, uh, at the grassroots that people uh, are very entirely capable of in, uh, in um, uh, subsisting under very difficult conditions, uh, but in making this value chain work. Um, so we can talk more about the details of this perhaps in, uh, in questions, but I want to sort of uh, warn against uh, the danger of some of, you know, fairly sim uh, simple labels about tradition on the one hand and a shift to uh, something that's much more modern uh, on the other. On the right-hand side, another dimension uh, to this uh, SDG 7 uh, challenge. So here, I think we're all familiar with the desire to promote renewable um, sources of energy. Uh, and you've, you can see in the, in the kind of gleaming photovoltaic panel over there, you know, this is a future. This is the future we all want as we try and move away, uh, especially um, reliance on coal in large-scale uh, power plants. And that's fine. Um, but if you look at uh, this, the scientific li uh, literature, for example, in geosciences, uh, on what would um, be the impact of completely moving to a renewable uh, um, energy-based economy, um, you, f you find some very disturbing um, uh, statistics and figures there about the impact that this is going to have in terms of mine mining. Um, so the point made here is that on the one hand, when we talk about renewable energy technologies, they rely on rare metals, but they also rely on very basic stuff, concrete, um, aluminum, um, you know, very basic uh, uh, minerals and, and metals. And you've got our geoscientists sort of drawing attention to the fact that um, we, shouldn't, we should be mindful uh, of the impact on the environmental impacts of mining uh, when it comes to uh, trying to promote something like this shift to more modern and renewable uh, sources of energy. So just in conclusion, I want to uh, summarize then, what does this example uh, have to offer uh, for thinking about the role of the social sciences uh, in the context of knowledge advice on SDGs? So I think one of the things that we can offer is a sense of where to look for sources of knowledge. So very often part of, what, uh, the, uh, part of the work that we do is not just drawing on our, our own, if you like, social science insights or social science knowledge, but also looking at diversity within the biophysical sciences, which is important um, to, to bring to the table. Because very often you've got you know, different uh, parts of the biophysical sciences saying some quite different things. And, uh, and who's represented at the table in policy debates is not always, um, uh, doesn't always capture this diversity. Um, there's issues here around that uh, social sciences can bring on framing of problems, uh, allowing different framings to have a chance for influence in a pol policy context. Um, and as I said, um, uh, contributing to um, uh, thinking about where do we focus our attention in trying to understand problems that I think we all have already acknowledged uh, are very complex and interconnected uh, to begin with. So in order to put the nature of these problems in a more systemic uh, and social uh, and material context, uh, I think there's, there's something that here that the social sciences can, um, can offer. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say, I know that in a, in a science advice context, we heard from um, Helen Clark this morning about the importance of um, uh, identifying priorities, right? We can't do everything. So obviously there's an interest there in articulating and finding ways of um, solving uh, these problems, these complex and interconnected problems. Um, what I want to just draw attention to there is that the role of the role of the social sciences in contributing uh, methods, uh, techniques, approaches for thinking about how do we engage people uh, from diverse, uh, diverse backgrounds, different stakeholders, different publics uh, in contributing to the identification of, of solutions. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Christine uh, Weidenslaufer, which is uh, a policy analyst at the uh, uh, Library of Congress in uh, Chile. And uh, so I think we will take a deep dive into the practice of actually providing social science advice in a real world setting. Please, Christine. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Christine Weidenslaufer, and I come from the Chilean Congress. So 
I, I was telling here my colleagues, I feel like a bit the fish out of the pond, of the science pond, you know, the lawyers. We think that um, lawyers, we have the instrument, the ultimate instrument to regulate and deal with human behavior. So uh, we've realized that that's not <laughs> true. <laughs> And that's how I'm going to tell you what we've tried to do at the Chilean Congress in order um, to deal with SDGs and in particular with any issues involving science and other matters. So this is what normally we have. I would like to start with this. <laughs> so okay, if you can see this. And this is the kind of decision makers <laughs> normally that we have to deal with all over the world. I mean, this is not just a Chilean situation. <laughs> so when we uh, are required to act on this like information, we don't want ignorant decision makers. <laughs> uh, here we want science advisors or policy advisors coming to, into work. And I want to put you in context. This is the country we have. We have a rather small country. We're just uh, 18 million uh, people. Uh, and we have a presidential type of government, which means that uh, Congress has little power in order to set the agenda, in order to uh, make the larger decisions, and it, we're more like a, a co. It's in, it called they're called co-legislators, you know, Congress and uh, presidency. But the presidency is very strong, so the impact that Congress has is smaller than, for example, parliamentarian government. And this is library Congress. We have two two different. Uh, buildings and we are kind of older institution and this is how we got to this where I work uh, this parliamentary technical advisory service this was set up 10 years ago we're br rather new and young and we've been dealing with all these questions on, on science and how to deal with very but this is the interesting we are fully transdisciplinary, or this is at least our goal, the way we're uh, focusing our work. We're nonpartisan, uh, in-house mm -hmm. information service. So it's pretty interesting because we give the question, how do we solve this? How do we deal with this? And this is the first solution for them. And I'm a comparative law expert. So we come somewhere else this has to be been solved. Because we're developing countries, so of course you have to have um, some uh, developed country that has already dealt with it. And this is for ex an example. We have SDG 15, Sustainable Development, and we have the target for, to have by 2020 ensure the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of terrestrial and inland freshwater and ecosystems. So we have to take care of forests. This is a solution, for example, we found, because this is our compliance for Chile, and we had nothing, to, nothing uh, informed on that, because we just informed on five other SDGs, including poverty, health, infrastructure, and others. So from Congress, uh, we um, support especially motions from parliamentarians, not from you know, uh, the executive. And this was one, we call in Rent Right of Environmental Conservation, translation, which was, uh, was an idea coming from uh, one a group of parliamentarians, and we supported strongly uh, in order to find a way to introduce this as a legal transplant, but a legal transplant that works, because not everything works, you know, when you see it outside. So uh, this is inspired in in conservation easements in the US. But that's a common law country, and we're a civil law country. So we, have, we had to resolve that. And we figured out a way in order to create this new institution, which 
has been working now for two years, and we think is, is uh, a good example of how integrating different experience and different professions within our advisory service, mm -hmm. we came up with this solution. And it's very beautiful when it worked. This is another example of the, fir of the same in instrument. So you can see that even with little institutional resources, and by resources I also mean by capabilities and legal possibilities of, of action, we dealt with these issues and in incorporating not only attorneys like me, like the competitive law expert, but also the other experts within our group, which includes scientists, which includes um, included social uh, um, scientists, uh, and the problem that we are facing now is like when there's no solution in, in comparative law. And that's what, this is what we've been doing. We're networking with social uh, science organizations in order to uh, have complementary support and we're giving lectures on science. We're trying for our own, not only from outside ex uh, ex experts, but only our uh, inside, in-house experts to understand that we have to work all together, that we need to incorporate uh, science in our decisions and using their perspective from the social sciences. We're working with young scientists, so okay experts from the soil science, we're opening our eyes and understanding that uh, we have to work together in these areas. And we're consulting experts. And we're doing TV programs. So this was, for example, to incorporate women in politics. Uh, and these are very, very interesting experiences for us, are very enlightening for parliamentarians too, to understand that they have to incorporate all the sciences within their decision making. And we're here also to learn and bring back whatever other experience we can, we can learn. So thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for a few questions if there are any at this point for clarification. If that's not the case, I think we will move on and uh, have the next presentation by uh, Matthias Kaiser, uh, who's a professor and director of the Center for the Study of the Sciences and Humanities at University of Bergen in Norway. And uh, I know that Matthias has been doing a lot of work in ethics around new technologies and also been a strong advocate for the role of humanities in European policymaking. So uh, welcome to you, Matthias. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'm honored to be here and with this distinguished audience and this beautiful place. Um, I'll, I'll try to be short. I'll, uh, I'll give you some viewpoints. This is the title that I came up with just recently. It's about radical inter interdisciplinarity. And that just means it's not the interdisciplinarity, the interdisciplinarity that people easily talk about, you know, from the uh, microbiology department to another biology department or the chemistry department, but actually from that department to the law department, to the social sociology, to the philosophers or what have you, right? And that kind of interdisciplinarity, when, and what I'm gonna say is that is when post-normality becomes the rule and all knowledge becomes soft, and what you're going to hear is, of course, deeply subjective. There is not, this is nothing of my research. This is the upshot. This is my personal interpretation. And it's heavily value-based. Uh, I invite you to value uh, discussions about this. So the basic thing that I want to do in this here, in this short time, is I present you with what I view as the four big challenges to science advice to government, right? And I'll just label them. That may not be comprehensive, maybe you have more. But first there is this, and I, I'll explain that in the, in the later part. First there is the holistic challenge. That is that complex issues call always for radical interdisciplinarity. The SDGs will be the example. We have heard that already. And uh, the other side of the coin is that internally 
I think we are not quite ready for that. That is, the sciences, all of them, not the natural scientists, but not the humanities and the social scientists either. But anyway, we'll, I'll come back to that. And then there is the pragmatic challenge, and that is that there is a tension between the expectations that we sort of are asked to meet from those that are the decision makers and what we honestly can provide as science advice. And then there is the post-normal challenge. And now I'm not going to talk a lot about the post-normal view of science. Uh, those of you who have read some of the publications of Peter Gluckman know that he has been very much putting that into this context here. But uh, there is at least uh, the challenge that we have to be much more sophisticated to integrate uncertainties, values, and alternative knowledge sources. And we need to provide knowledge quality assessments, which I think is a little bit different from the usual call for you know, evidence-based policies. Of course, that sounds very good, but we have to ask, what is the evidence? You know? And it's not necessarily measured in in number of citations or what kind of journal and, and all of that. We have to move away from that and we have to have a deeper knowledge quality assessment. And finally, there is the trust challenge. This has been, I mean, I'm not saying anything new here. You all have heard that now, I don't know how many times, that trust is the crucial, is the key to all of that, right? So, and I, what I'm gonna say is, yes, there is all the challenge from the outside. There is this what is it called, the post-truce area, you know, and alternative facts and all of that, but we're also facing facts inside our, our own community and the sciences, right? So, and we actually, I think I would even formulate it more strongly, we are in a number of crises here, I'll come back to that, that re relates to ethics, integrity and all of this, and we need to be much more reflexive. Now, and that goes to all of the sciences, but my point in all of that is, the social sciences and the humanities have actually a lot to contribute to these processes. Okay, uh, here's the first thing. That's nothing new to you. I mean, we have heard that already. Here is complexity ahead. And now, one thing to realize is this is what is called wicked problems, right? I mean, the wicked, uh, you probably know the classic text from Rittle and what's his name, Beber, 1973, right? Now, one of the things is, the wicked problems are, they don't have a stopping point, right? There's no predefined stopping point. You don't really know when the solution is there because it's not about falsity or, or, or truth. It's about, is it good or is it bad or is it better or is it worse, right? Again, we are into an area of values and that has to be negotiated. When do we actually reach all of them? If we have the illusion that there is a number that could you know, tell us, now you've done all that, then I think we are on the wrong track, right? But we need to have a, a communication about these things. Anyway, so this is all patchwork and this is value laden. So, yes, we realize, many people realize the complexity and every, and at least in my country, I don't know about yours, but there's a lot of lip service. Oh yes, we need the social sciences. Oh yes, we need the humanities. Everybody agrees to that. But what they mean is, we, do, we deal with them as an addendum, as an appendix to all the other serious, sorry, serious work, you know, but the, the, the natural science work. And I, you know, I realized you were actually making that point also because then they say, yes, yes, we, we, we'll do the, we look at the world and you explore the social cultural consequences and discuss how we can achieve the social acceptance of our new technologies and all of that, right? No, no, that is not the way it works. It's not coming at the end. It is right in front and it has to be integrated. We need to have a co-production of the science, a co-production of the knowledge sources that we're gonna use for the science advice, okay? So I'm gonna use just a, a short episode here. I have been engaged uh, for the, uh, what's it called, SAPIA, the Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. Uh, this is what they do. I'm gonna, not going to say much more about that, but just one thing. The one thing that I remember, maybe not maybe with mixed feelings, but actually more good feelings than bad, 
this was the science advice. And there is actually, I think they have sent some papers here to these meetings as well. Anyway, so it's, it's about food from the oceans, right? And that started out with the same idea. Oh, we have this natural science group working on the real options, and then we have the social science group working on how that all can be achieved, you know, in a social situation and policy and all of that. Now, the good thing about that was that all the members in both groups from the very beginning said, hey, that doesn't work, we need to sit together from the beginning, right? So, because it, it's not like that. We are talking about food from the oceans, right? This is not about a certain fish species or a certain algae or something. This is something that goes into a value chain, right? So we need to work together and discuss that together. And so you can see that part of that is, uh, I'm proud of that. We, you know, eating smart. I mean, just look at that. There is, of course. It, in, this relates to seaweed, for example, right? I mean, in Asia, it's nothing new. In Europe, it is very new. But, I mean, s seaweed, yes, it's a resource, you know. But to consider it as a food is a new thing. We need to do something more about that. We need to raise an awareness among the people that, hey, you know, what, what, it is that, what do you eat? Is it really smart eating? Is it ethical, for example, to throw away, how much is it, um, 80 kilograms per, per person in Europe or something? Uh, of, of food every year. Anyway, something like that. So all of this goes into it, and it's an embedded process, right? So this is, that's what I'm saying. The standard view has been to keep that parallel and separate it. I think that's all wrong, and I think the good experiences are when we combine them from the very start, and when we realize precisely the kind of linkage, linkage that we have been he hearing before, right? That what the word consists of is also part of you know, the social reality surrounding it, and the other way around. Now to the pragmatic challenge. Uh, you all know maybe that joke of, um, I'm told that it was President Nixon, I don't know if that's true, who said, oh, I really want a one-armed one uh, science advisor for my government. Why that? Well, you're always here on the one hand and on the other hand, you know. So yes, he wants, to just no ambigu ambiguity, please, give us a straightforward, clear device Yes or no? Now, science is very often of the ambiguity type. And that we have to adapt to this. The decision maker has maybe other needs. And also in the science, we have a myriad of relevant factors. The decision maker says, hey, come on, give me a single number, you know, uh, something that I can measure. So that in four years' time after my period, I can say we have achieved 90% of this. And um, the researchers typically say, oh, yes, very important question, but we would like to do more research first. Well, policymakers need the answers typically right now, right? And, um, and then the scientists very often say, oh, you know, we cannot really predict what is going to happen with all of this, and, you know, with the resources and all of this. And then, of course, the decision makers, and I say rightly so, say, hey, come on, we, we, we pay you to at least try to predict. And what else are you good for if you cannot help us for the future things, right? So make an effort. Yes, your knowledge is not perfect, but make it the best out of that. So this, I think, is a pragmatic challenge. And, um, and that leads to a number of issues. One of the things is that we have developed, we are quite on the, particularly on the global level with the United Nations and all of that, we have developed global composite indicators about, for example, here is the ecological footprint. We can just say the same about democracy, about corruption, about poverty, and all of that. All of these are very sort of composite issues. Now, um, and they serve a purpose. However, I think the voice of science, and that includes also the, um, the social sciences and humanities, what we need to provide some more qualitative narratives around them and make them local and adapt them and break them down into more concrete issues. Like if you look more concretely in this one, for example, you can see that, hey, you know, there has been a change, but the change has all been, you know, due to one factor alone, and that's the energy use here. All the others remain uh, stable. So in that sense, if you make it more local, if you make it culturally adapted, you can avoid 
some of the biases that, biases that are built into these global um, composite indicators. Now to the third one, the post-normal challenge. And I don't know, I mean, I'm at least grown up with this, that, uh, I don't know, values have nothing to do with the science. You know, oh yes, we, we, are, sort of, we, are, we are descriptive and that's it. And um, I, I studied mathematics and philosophy and actually for a while both of them embraced that view. Um, in the natural sciences, I think some of them still do. Now, if, if metals become complex, we, we cannot really do that anymore. We, we, we see very easily, if you do a risk assessment or anything like that, you cannot do without some kind of values you know, coming into your way and you, you're actually guiding you on your, on your, on your method. And the, the post normal science view is basically a view that says, hey, come on, that's, in, in some way, it's a normal state of affairs when you have these complex issues, you know. The stakes are high, the facts are typically uncertain, values are in dispute, and decisions are urgent, right? So what we need to do is we, we have to become much more sophisticated because for a decision maker, it is equally important to know what we don't know as it is what we know. Right? And, and, and these things have to be on the table and not just on the back of your mind. So how do we go about that? And that's not enough with the statistical error margin because the sources of uncertainty come in many dimensions. Right? So how do we do that? Why don't we train people to be more sophisticated than that? That's one of the challenges there. Knowledge quality assessment I mentioned, which is done by Jerome van der Slice. One of the things, anyway, from, these are people from my place. Anyway. So, um, and so, well, I, I'll, I'll just I have made that already here at this point. I'll jump over that. Uh, that is, uh, yes, we need to get away from the view that the quality of our knowledge is, you know, captured by some of those standard, uh, you know, uh, indicators that we have, like, you know, publications and, and, and Hirsch index or what have you. So we have to get away from that. But I'll, um, and, and that I think the humanities and the social sciences can provide us an embedding of, of, of the knowledge quality that, that can be useful. I, because I'm a little bit of a running in time here, I'll, I'll go to the next one, the trust challenge and the, the final one, the crisis. And I said this is basically dealing with challenges on two fronts. The one is in front and the other is in the back. We are at the interface here between science and, and policy, right? And the one is the policy, we have heard about that, this is the post truth and whatever, but the other is in our sciences. And typically, of course, we can go around and say, oh, you know, the sciences, we, are, we have the knowledge and they ignore it. But the knowledge, if you look deeper into that, is, is not always that good. Right? Actually, we, have, we are facing now more and more, and that is precisely because of our reliance on these you know, quantitative indicators. We are facing more and more a challenge to the quality of our knowledge. And that has also to do with, it's related to the ethics of science, the lack of integrity. So, and we should address that elephant in the room much more openly than, than we have done so far. So, the, um, the su supposedly objective system to monitor and navigate the quality of sciences are, in effect, counterproductive. And that we, we have to point out time and again. And maybe those that study the sciences, you know, whatever, the sociologists, the historians, and the philosophers and others, th they should do so much more. And there is Campbell's law that basically says the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. In other words, the more they measure your quality of your output by the number of publications, the more you will disregard what's in the publications but just count the numbers, right? And that is not beneficial to the good advice that you want to do. And actually, you may even end up, as we now know and we see many times, we do have problems with the integrity of science, with the ethics of science. 
you know, and, and that, of course, has raised some alarm. I mean, I'm talking now in, in the European context, but I'm sure this is worldwide. We have seen that, you know, fraud in science has raised, you know, a lot of concern. And this is the so-called FFP, the fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism issue, right? And, and that's in the law or somewhere, and everybody makes a big fuss about that. But we know that happens, yes. But it's still only a minor issue. But then there is all this questionable research practices, which is quite significant, right? And issues like, uh, you know, authorship issues, or dealing with the data, how to deal with the data, providing the correct information, and all of that. This is the questionable research practices. And then that goes over to the quality deficiencies that we produce. Like, why is it that there's so much science that we cannot reproduce? In some parts, they talk about 80% of what is published in respectable journals cannot be reproduced, right? We can talk about p-hacking and other practices. All of this is still encouraged but it's undermining the quality of the sciences that we do. So, in other words, what I'm arguing for, and, well, just leave that out. <laughs> well, um, we need to have a critical look at that, and we need to be aware, and we need to make these conflicts aware. This is also from another, or this is from the same issue. Just the simple question, what is the state of the world fisheries, right? This is the FAO. Uh, on the left-hand side, world capture features and aquaculture production. Now, when we considered that, immediately there was the protest saying, hey, come on, this is all, this is all wrong because, you know, the aquaculture, first of all, the aquaculture is also the, uh, the inland aquaculture, and secondly, uh, a lot of the fish that is captured goes into the aquaculture as the feet, right? So, and then it doesn't include all the illegal fisheries in the world, right? So then there are other estimates up there on the top which includes, you know, an estimate of those fishery, uh, fishing practices that are illegal. And there are others. Anyway, there are compete, even on the most basic issues, there are competing things. And we need to be open about that. We need to address that. And that, I think, can be done with a lot of the help from, or reflection from the sciences. So, and I'm coming to my last slide now. So what I'm arguing for is in order to provide that advice, we all need to head for what I would say, slow science. I like slow food. I think we should, we should opt for more slow science that is better quality assurance of the science that we produce, particularly because it is important, potentially even more important when we look at these big development goals. We need transparency, we need open science, we need, a, we need to change the reward system and the assessment, and we need better, better ethics in science. And we need to talk about that. We need to talk about that in a wider context among all the disciplines, and we should utilize the historical, philosophical, sociological knowledge about power relations in science, whatever we have, but we should also talk about with that with all the knowledge users, the decision makers, of course, but in general, I would opt for the larger publics as well, and all of that. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> and um, thank you for that, Matthias. Uh, we will... Uh, quickly move on to the last speaker and then into the Q&A. So uh, please prepare your remarks and uh, your input. Uh, our last speaker uh, this morning is uh, Mark Zainer, who is a professor and chair of the Department for uh, Geography and Environment at the University of Ottawa, Canada. Um, welcome, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bart. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I think my talk follows quite well Matthias's points because I do actually believe that we need measurement, we need indicators, but I also will talk a fair bit about ethics, which follows a bit my path. I did my PhD in ecology, worked as an ecologist for several years, and I was a little bit curious about all the, uh, the value input we had in our work, and then decided to uh, study environmental ethics and philosophy. So something I learned in, I should maybe tell you first, the, the, the work I will draw on is, based on two papers that came out in 2016, one in 2018, I did those with my PhD student, Michael Bord, and they have to do broadly with the morality of earth measurement and had the construction of ecosystem accounting uh, frameworks and, and indicators. 
Uh, in philosophy I learned you have to give people the argument up front because no philosopher believes in anything. And so you have to, believe, you have to equip people uh, with all the tools possible so you can start criticizing as I go along. The point, um, the argument I propose is that we have looked at ecosystem global, global ecosystem accounting frameworks and in our judgment there are, there are many of them. All of them are incomplete and unbalanced in an important way. Uh, we'll also argue that what you measure is what you manage. I think that is actually true. It's very important to decide what you measure if you want to uh, end up with uh, results. The uh, analysis shows that anthropocentrism is a problem in this case because it's perhaps taken, I think, taken too far. The way the SDGs are formulated doesn't exactly help, but I also don't think it's a problem, so I will talk about that. And then more in terms of uh, solution, if one would use what we know, uh, we argue that the, we would arrive at better, more balanced ways to do ecosystem accounts, earth measurement. It would have the benefit that once you respect uh, the environmental issues ethically, broadly, that you have a better chance of buy-in by all environmentalists. Uh, you avoid repeating the mistakes of the past and hopefully by having better accounts, better measures would lead to better science advice. I put a question mark there, I think everyone knows why. It's hard to get from good data to, to good advice. So I have six slides on uh, 100 years of environmental ethics, just to illustrate uh, what I mean with anthropocentrism. I want to start uh, 100 years ago with the extinction of the passenger pigeon. This happened in, the United, in North America, and it was, I believe, very significant for the perception of the relationship of people to the land. You see here huge swarms of passenger pigeons they were so dense that you could kill them by just shooting into the, into the swarm and the birds would fall down, you could eat them. In 1914, uh, the, approximately, the species became extinct and that's probably the reason why the bison didn't become extinct because it made a big impression on people that it's actually possible to so quickly bring about, about the extinction of a species and it came as an utter surprise to people. 25 years later, another, I think, in, important event was the formulation of the land ethic by Aldo Leopold. So Leopold was a scientist, cons he wrote an important book on conservation ecology, and uh, was quite concerned about the maintenance of the land. And towards the end of his career, he formulated a, a view on how people should relate to the land and the key pieces are that we should stop being conquerors of the land. We should become plain citizens of it. We should value the aesthetics and we should worry about integrity and stability. And that is really a very good foundation to show clearly the dependency and our interest in when we look after our own <laughs> needs to simultaneously look uh, after the needs of, bio of the biotic community. Because if you don't, it's at your peril. If you just say, well, look after us, the rest will follow, this piece of history shows this, is, uh, this will cause problems. Next spot, again, 20 years later, the realization that we are uh, stuck on Earth, Earth rise by, uh, by, uh, taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts, the first people getting out of orbit around the moon, became one of the most produ reproduced photos in the history of the world. Approximately simultaneously, Buckminster Fuller argued that we have to write a manual for our spaceship Earth. And I think that uh, is also very important to remember the confinement. So we are growing in a population, and there is a limited space. 20 years later, again, Brundtland Report. You can see here, or you know perhaps already, that this had to do with development, so it's a good predecessor of the SDGs. And in the introduction and the preamble of the Brundtland report, so this is Gro Harlem Brundtland, Prime Minister of Norway, the point was made that, or the view was expressed, that arguing that nature has value in it for its own sake, intrinsic value, has given the entire environmental movement a connotation of naivety. So this is really against what I said before. This is the view that 
If you want to work politically and if you want to respect the needs of developing countries, you cannot worry too much about biota. You have to start with people first. So this I will just want to illustrate as a back and forth in, uh, in emphasis. Then another sort of, you know, the pendulum swings. Earth Charter 2001, final text. Maurice Strong and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev spearheaded that effort. And I find very, very actually, actually surprising almost that the very first principle is to respect and care for the community of life. Respect Earth and life in all its diversity. So it's a very green document. And it actually, in its first version, which is no longer around, but I had, I still have, uh, the word intrinsic value is actually expressed. So this brings me to the SDGs. If you look at the SDGs from that angle, and it's a slight caricature, but if you actually separate the anthropocentric perspective and the ecocentric perspective, you can very clearly see that the language of these headings is very human focused. And there's very well little that speaks directly about, let's say, the land or the biotic communities. Now, of course, everything is completely interconnected. And I don't see this as a major problem if the, the system as a whole is actually measured. If biodiversity maintenance is taken truly seriously, it's not a problem. But it is a problem if uh, it leads to na a naive form of human-centered indicators where we just believe that by taking good care of ourselves, we automatically will take care of the planet. So in my view, strict anthropocentrism is a problem because the first problem is buy-in. We have a, you know, half a century at, at least of activism in environment. And if you don't do a little bit more in terms of language and emphasis about the interests of what you could call real environmentalists or perhaps radical environmentalists, you lose part of your, your support. It ignores some les lessons from history, I believe. And my biggest concern is, is that a narrow and biased measurement will also uh, could easily lead to, to the same for defects in science advice. This is my last slide. I'm well aware that you can't uh, decipher it. It's a heat map. I just wanted to show you how we approach this from a perspective of looking for solutions. So we have developed 10 criteria building on uh, previous authors who have proposed six that we believe are essential to get buy-in from all from environmentalists of all stripes and actually get good results. And we benchmark the existing 16 frameworks against it. And all I really wanted to see is, is that, as you probably would expect, that there is not a single one which is strong on all these indicators. So just uh, to, to wrap this up, um, I think the way you look, use ethics, what you value has an effect on what you measure, what you measure has an effect on what you manage, and what you manage has an effect on where you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to all four speakers for very strong presentation. So uh, one person who is not uh, paying only lip service to uh, using the social sciences and humanities in policy making is uh, David Mayer, who I'm asked to give a couple of responses to the talks this, uh, this uh, morning. Uh, David is uh, head of unit at the European Commission's Joint Research Center in uh, Brussels and is uh, right now heading a very interesting initiative called Enlightenment 2.0 in which he and colleagues are trying to mobilize actually the social science community in order to inform policymakers better. So David, uh, please give us your responses. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, four things I picked out uh, from the fascinating presentations from the speakers. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, I think I picked this up from, from Matthias's work, that Policy making integrates seamlessly both science and knowledge and values. Uh, if you haven't read it, I advise you very strongly to go back and look at the original article on wicked problems and read the abstract, which, give or take one word, I think is an almost perfect understanding of the challenges we face in bringing evidence to policy. Uh, and I think the most crucial uh, aspect of that is it makes very clear that policy making is completely different from science in many ways. 
Science is an analytical process. Policy making is at the same time both an analytical and a normative process. Uh, and unfortunately, the analytical and the normative conversations confound each other and interfere in each other in a very difficult way. Um, and the great news about SSH is that it can really help because people in SSH understand values and they know how to talk about them. So I think that SSH can really help us have better conversations in policy making that enable us to be very clear when we're talking about the facts and when we're talking about the values. So to better organize the analytical uh, and the normative. The metaphor I often use is, is you know, science is, is a more uh, analytical conversation and you're thinking maybe about trying to build a rocket and the question is, you know, how do we build a rocket to take us to the moon? And it's pretty free of values, that question. It's kind of an analytical one. But policy making isn't about necessarily about working out how to build a rocket to take you to the moon. It's working out how to build a rocket at the same time having a debate about whether you want to go to the moon or whether you want to go to Mars and which is a better place to go to and why that should be. And you're trying to do both things at the same time and we're not terribly good at that. So I think there's, there's something SSH can do to help us sort out the normative and the analytical. Um, but then also uh, Sujatha said something which, which resonated very much uh, with me about the, uh, the importance also of values uh, in the scientific process. Uh, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, science is, is, is saturated with values and I don't think we, we talk enough, clearly enough about that. And the place where it is really, really saturated in values is the place that people don't talk about much at all, which is in the choices of careers people make, and then the choices of research, the questions they decide to follow, and the choices of things that get funded for research and things which don't, which, as far as I can see, are all purely values-based subjective judgments. And that is very often where the values gets into the science. And if you scratch people who are unhappy with evidence-based policy, what you discover very often is they are not unhappy with evidence-based policy per se. No one really thinks that gut instinct will help you make better decisions. What they're unhappy with is that certain pieces of science have either been researched or not researched and are taken into account in the process. That's the problem. So the really, probably the most important values-based political moment in evidence for policy is the bit right at the beginning when you decide what are we going to fund and which piece of which evidence is can account towards this debate. And unfortunately, the policymakers don't recognize that as probably the most important political moment either. So Sujatha, you said SSH can bring us different framings. And it's at that moment to say, hang on, what about some evidence of this or that or the other? Why don't we start to collect some of that? That's absolutely crucial. Uh, Matthias, you said complex problems need radical interdisciplinarity. Uh, yes. Someone told me yesterday that the phrase interdisciplinarity was coined 80 years ago. And in 80 years, I don't think we've made a single iota of progress in doing interdisciplinary working. Uh, the incentives are not there in the science system, and the level of craft and practice in doing this is still at an absolutely pitiful level. Uh, and so if we don't tackle both the incentives and the craft of doing interdisciplinary working, we're going to be in deep trouble, in particular because it's getting worse. Disciplines are fragmenting, people are disappearing down rabbit holes all the time. And no policymaker can cope with people uh, who are stuck within their own discipline. So this is a huge problem. Fourth point, uh, I think we need a big shout out to artists as uh, going to be fundamental players uh, in helping uh, make sense of evidence and policies. Two things, uh, one mentioned. First one is futures thinking. Uh, so uh, I think Claire Craig, who's here, has pointed to this huge value in, in speculative fiction, in helping us imagine new futures. Futures work is at the heart of uh, evidence for policymaking. But also narrative, which is a fundamental skill, which is going to be at the heart of bringing evidence for policy. And there are some people in the arts who know quite a lot about narrative. Great. Thank you, David. So um, with those words, I think we are ready to kick off the discussion and the debate open uh, for questions and remarks among the audience and uh, get the conversation going. I'll just run here, Peter, and give you the mic. I came in a little bit late, so I apologize if I didn't, don't um, comment on 
something that may have all been ad already been addressed. But I want to pick up on this word values. Nobody debates that there are that there are values in science. Of course there are values in science. And David summarised some of the core values. There's another value which is really important in science advice, which is the one that Heather Douglas writes about so much, which is about the sufficiency and quality of, uh, of evidence on which to make uh, a decision or make a recommendation. They're really important. But the values that Matthias is talking about are largely a different very different set of values of how people have world views, how they, how they see the world, how they see themselves in the world, etc., etc., what they value, what they don't value. Now, scientists, of course, also have those values as, as human beings. But I'm worried in this conversation that we use this word values without, in fact, defining it or being clear about what we're talking about. When we just say, of course, science has values too, we're actually at risk of undermining the, the few things that science has that if you are, you might argue, are reasonably values free and give value science its, its, its possible positioning with some level of privilege. Namely, that the whole point of the processes of science are to eliminate as much as possible bias from the collection and analysis of data. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't, the biases don't exist, but that's the whole point of scientific processes, whatever they are. So I think we've got to be very careful in this discussion, not because I don't disagree with anything that's said, but it could be misinterpreted if we're not careful about what we mean when we talk about values, whether we're talking about broad societal values, biases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. So that's sparking off some more hands, but uh, first of all, I will give the panelists a chance to respond quickly. Yeah, please do. Well, y yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And actually, I mean, the, the important role of values goes back all the way to antiquity. You know, an action is typically explained by three factors. Our effects, you know, the emotions that guide us, the cognition, the things that we know or believe we know, and third, the, well, the cognitive factor, that is the values, the goals that we have, where we want to go. In that sense, I think it is very important to be explicit about it, right? So, because sustainable development is all about setting valuable goals for us, that's one of the things. Now, and we need to have a process about that. And some of these values are inherent. Now, what we are not good at, and that is a point of reflection, and that is one thing that I always raise with among the social scientists, is we are still naive about these values. We, we have them in all kinds of political talks, and, you know, and we have value-based communities, and, and what have you. But values are, you know, when it comes to the thing, very often mostly in, in conflict with each other. You know, it's all, what do the Englishmen say, um, um, motherhood and apple pie and, and, and stuff like that, you know, all the good things. But when it comes down to action, we really don't know very much about what drives us, what are those valuable goals. And we don't make them the topic of our research even, or actually there is research, there's world value studies, but that is lacking in quality. So we need to intensify that de debate much more than we have done. Just a quick one on, um, thank you for that question. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I agree with that. But uh, just to say that we can also think of values in uh, with a kind of small little V, if you like. And so one of the things there has to do with, um, you know, what kinds of evidence uh, from which uh, part of the scientific research community is valued in the advisory process. Um, so in the area that I've also been doing a lot of work on, on antibiotic resistance, you know, there's kind of evidence coming from a clinical setting but there's also some very interesting evidence from an ecological, environmental, scientific um, kind of uh, community. Um, and there are deep questions there about which are value-laden, um, which have to do with how you um, judge and evaluate these different sources of evidence. So I think partly I was thinking of it also in, you know, that's another side of the value question that we uh, want to think about. Okay. We have, Mark, you want to come in? Yes. I would just like to add that if we really want to work interdisciplinarily, as it was said uh, a lot already today, then it really requires um, a, sort of an element of empathy with the other profession. And I think we should just be a bit careful in uh, 
understanding what, what we say, if you, for example, say science is value-laden, which is clear. But you're really dealing with people who um, spend all their life controlling bias. That's the whole point. And what you're really saying is, I can, I'm from a different profession, I'm a philosopher, I can help you with controlling bias. To someone who has made its profession, her profession is profession to actually control bias. It's a bit like if someone comes to philosopher says, if scientist comes to philosopher and says, there's just one thing you philosophers do badly, it's you have no idea how to get coherence in systems. Or very bad analysts. So I think we have to, in terms of language, we have to really be very, very careful how we say it in order not to undermine our efforts to really work interdisciplinarily. Very good point. Thanks. Uh, thank you for an amazing uh, session. Um, I'm Michael Barber from the Australian Academy of Science. I am a scientist, I'm a computational scientist too. I believe in data, but I also believe in human. What I wanted to do with a little forbearance, I wanted to reflect on a program we ran in Australia. From 2012 to 2016, the four learned academies, science, technological science and engineering, social sciences and the humanities, had $10 million to do science public policy. I had the pleasure, for most of the time, chairing the oversight committee. That committee had three representatives from, four of the, from each of the four of the panels. And genuinely, we tried to work our way through the strengths of the four academies. The problems were tended to be a little bit science-based, um, unconventional gas in Australia, but also the Australian diaspora in Asia. So it was across the board. Reflecting on those four years and listening to this discussion, there are two remarks I'd like to make, particularly around our key issue of better science policy advice. Firstly, when you put those panels together, and I suspect you found that in the European thing, the dimen two dimensions I think you need are expertise and you need cognitive diversity. And you need to ensure that the members of the panels understand their cognitive biases, their values, the way they perceive the world. Because an ecologist and an economist don't believe it in the same way. Towards the end of the program, I discovered the writing of Scott Page from Michigan who talks about cognitive diversity in public policy. And what he talks about makes a lot of sense. Now, from a public policy point of view and a science advice on public policy, what intrigued me is despite having all the wisdom, and we ran a program called Technology in Australia's Economic, Social and Political, uh, um, Social, Environmental Future, I had a chapter on electric cars. They had economists in the room, social scientists. Did they think about the short-term implications of moving to electric cars on road taxes, all that dimension? No. And so now we've got a Productivity Commission inquiry looking into how you deal with road funding. So in that space, I find it interesting that the experts have never quite, you know, sort of focused their area. And if we could get that right, I think it's powerful. I believe most of what you said, Matthias, but I'd probably sort of, you know, tone it down a little for public policy people. But I think that's a really interesting space. The strength of bringing those four disciplines together. But first thing I think is, break down the cognitive barriers, understand the values that are driving. The things we don't talk about, as you said, David, I think that's almost worth the first week of a group coming together. And I suspect you found that in the European um, projects. Right, yes, Matthias. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's also a, a remark to what has been said earlier, that we have had 80 years of talk about interdisciplinarity and, and, and it's still difficult. Well, interdisciplinarity is not necessarily with the individual, but it's precisely in the setting of these groups. It's, it's, it's an attitude that you bring to solving a problem, that you realize your own limitations, you bring in your expertise and discuss it and open up for the others, right? And you, you engage in a process, precisely these, these kinds of processes that you describe. What I see as, as, as a difficulty sometimes, that has to do something with what Peter was saying also about the, the danger of the value attitudes is that there are nowadays also sections of science that are so, let's say, value committed. That is, you know, there they are um, advocacy. That they are sort of advocating. And I mean, I have been now in, 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 in meetings of 
marine conservationists and all of that, right? And, and I, I, I feel like um, th they're all so sure that, oh, we need to, you know, count the, the, the sharks and we need to do this and preserve this and more and more preservation. And nobody asked the question, I mean, shouldn't we also use some of the marine spaces? Shouldn't we do have some, some, some fisheries because we need to, f you know, to have food? I mean, and, and that kind of thing. And if you are stuck in this kind of advocacy group, then I think you are outside the discussion. Then you're not part of that scientific community that opens up for the interdisciplinarity and for the questioning of your own approaches and expertise. But precisely giving these fora, and we haven't done that yet. We haven't done that in a large extent. I mean, uh, I think the standard model is still to keep things different, unfortunately. My name is Xavier Sikwe, I'm from the Seychelles. Um, my comment or my contribution to this conversation is that the, in the process uh, um, addressing like policy issues uh, for the SDGs, the social science and humanity should come timely. I say why, because I come from a, I'm, I've taken a particular industry. It took a long time for modern air transportation to, to bring the social sciences to address one factor. It was only 1980, around that day we are that we need to look at social factor that contributes to safety. So now after that, today we can traverse and be more safe because there's a lot of social science that has come to also in how we, we, we how the industry is managed, including from design of the uh, apparatus, ergometrics, everything. So I think because it took too long to realize that the social science and humanities are important, so maybe we can learn from that and say now addressing the SDG, it's, we start right from the start. Thank you. So are we, are we too slow in responding when we were getting invited into the conversation? I just want to maybe give a bit of hope here and also uh, disagree slightly with, with David. That's very rare, actually, to we'll disagree with him. But you said the, uh, we have made no progress on interdisciplinarity. Um, just, uh, I think we have made some institutional progress. There are universities who, that have merged. For example, the Faculty of Science and Faculty of Arts, Arizona State University is a great example. I think it has led to greater conversation, to the use of science fiction and technology assessment, etc. In Canada, one of the leaders in, in the, the in, so innovation system had an opportunity to start an undergraduate university. It's called Quest University. It has no faculties. Students go in that system. They have to formulate a question. That's why it's called question. They have to answer it any which way they want with whoever they want. And once they have to finish that, they'll get graduated. So I think things like this have happened, and they are significant, and uh, we just, it takes time. We'll take, we are getting to the closing of the session, so we'll take a couple of more comments. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bini Amsisai. I'm a member of the Global Young Academy, and currently working for UNESCO's International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa. I think this question is very much probably linked to what Matthias earlier said, but also to Mark's comment now. When it comes, you know, evidence is discriminated. So some evidence is more privileged to make it to policy circle than others. And it seems the social sciences and humanities are usually, you know, they, 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 they kind of take the back seat. And for this, particular situation, I think the world, when, it, when we see the MDG and the SDGs, uh, it's amazing how far it has, we, we have moved to make it more holistic, SDGs are more holistic, comprehensive in focusing on the issue and in, in trying to deal the whole of, of, of the whole of it. So my question is, I think it's the science community that is lagging behind. We're still following the same, there, there are a lot of good things happening here and there, but as, a, as an overall, as a community, I don't think we are able to go 
as much as we need to focus on, on the issues and to be to understand things holistically. So I'm just saying that I think the culprits are us, the science community, our institutions, our structures, our education, our training, and I think fingers have to be pointed. And for this, the move from MDG to SDG, in 15 years, I think the world has moved very far, and I don't think we have done the same progress when it comes to science TV community. Thank you. I don't know if this one is for you, Christine. I think, I mean, what you were talking about was really to institutionalize some of the social yes. science advice into parliaments and, and, and getting the right mixture of competence and expertise. Yes, listening to our great experts. Um, I feel that we've done, and probably it's been done in a lot of, in a lot of places, uh, we are like learning on the process. We weren't taught, uh, when we all started, I, in university, nobody taught us to look at the world from different perspectives, and we just focus on whatever uh, area of uh, knowledge that we were preparing into. So when you come into, for example, my area, where we don't generate knowledge, we just get it from where evidence is, and we have to learn as, a, as advisors to First, know what the right evidence we should be looking at. And second, uh, learn to use, uh, so to take this evidence and discuss it with these other experts. And discuss it among lawyers, and discuss it among scientists, and discuss it among psychologists, which we've been, been doing, uh, and scientific journalists. So it's a whole process, it's a whole package. And understanding where e every different profession come from, where the, the values that inform that profession in particular. So when you open your mind and understand, because the, what I'm saying, this is intuitive. We haven't learned it. We don't have a mythology yet. Uh, and I don't know how you know schools are understanding this problem and educating the new professionals better. Thank you. So actually, just a quick one on, the, on that point. Um, I think certainly at the level of uh, research, um, there is a discipline that describes itself as about integration and implementation. So integration and implementation sciences um, in Australia, Australian National University, uh, Gabriel Bammer, who I think some of you might know. Um, so there are, I, I think it's worth noting that there are people who, are, who now dedicate their kind of research attention to the uh, process of synthesis, but I think I agree, as you said, um, a lot more effort, and uh, as members of the audience highlighted, uh, a lot more effort needs to be put into kind of capacity building um, to start this process at an early age. So hopefully science communication centers um, have a role to play here uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, in those words, uh, I think we're going to end the session. Uh, I will not try to wrap up all the points, but uh, it's been a pleasure moderating you and listening to this morning's uh, very positive and kind of future-looking uh, conversations, uh, both as a moderator but also as a professor in the humanities. One of the major challenges talking about science advice is that immediately after we all acknowledge that we should have more of it and it should be better structured, we start deconstructing the notion and everybody is then kind of moving out of the conversation again. And that we kind of succeeded in not doing uh, today, we have actually all been trying to uh, think constructively about being present in a science advisory framework and, and environment. And I think that's really the way forward. Uh, together with colleagues in Copenhagen, we are currently conducting a systemic literature review on the entire science advice landscape. And uh, we find some of these biases. We can now document them and say, yes, there is a disciplinary bias in, in, science, in global science advice. We can see that humanities people are not always there. But at the other hand, Listening to conversations like this uh, at the international level, people are really interested in that. Also many people from the humanities, including early career researchers, say we should make our knowledge and our expertise count also in policy making. So uh, I think the SDGs and the conversation this morning has been extremely ins instrumental and, and helpful in organizing our ideas on this topic. Uh, in those words, we are closing the session and uh, I think there is lunch outside. Thank you.